to the Lamb. Hallelujah, hallelujah, by the blood of Christ we stand. Every tongue, every tribe, every people, every land, giving glory, giving honor, giving praise unto the Lamb of God. Giving praise unto the Lamb of God. Giving praise unto the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ, Lamb. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. Was there a gift like the Savior given? No, not one, no, not one. Sinner. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend, I tell you, there's not a friend. My brother, there's not a friend. No, not one, I tell you, no, not one.
first, third, and fourth verses together tonight. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as you service tonight. We're so grateful that you're here. I trust that you've had a good evening, or excuse me, a good afternoon. And again, thank you for being back tonight and allowing, uh, to, putting God first in your life all throughout uh, this day. And I was, grew, I grew up with uh, the knowledge and understanding uh, that the uh, Sunday is the Lord's day. We put him first that day, not just for one hour. Amen. And I believe that uh, we ought to do that, and, uh, and we find on Sunday nights, scriptural, if we want to be biblical and scriptural, we find the disciples were meeting on the first day of the week, that evening, the evening that Jesus rose from the grave, and I believe that's a good tradition to keep, and we're instructed to keep the traditions taught us, and I believe that uh, that's one good thing to do. It's, it's a great service. I love Sunday nights, and we're so grateful that you're here, and if you're glad to be here, would you say amen tonight? And we're grateful for your presence tonight. We want to go to the Lord in prayer and ask God for his help and his blessings in a great way. Uh, we have several that we want to mention to you uh, to be praying about. Do pray for Charles Petit. Uh, Charles has been watching online, and he's been out of the hospital now for a day or so. And he is at the Novant Rehabilitation Center on Stratford Road. And so I want to encourage you to pray for him as he uh, takes the rehab and and it gets back on his feet hopefully sometime soon to so be in prayer for him. And then Miss Barbara Falls uh, is not doing well. And so uh, I'm going to try to get by and see her sometime soon. Uh, so uh, just just uh, sleeping a lot and uh, not eating. And so we want to pray for her, if you will, please, uh, and perhaps reach out to them if you can and uh, let them know that you're thinking of them. And then one more, we have, of course, many, and we'll get most of these on Wednesday night, but one other Marsha Dowles, we miss Alan and Marsha. Uh, Alan's sick, and uh, Marsha uh, is scheduled for a spinal procedure on Tuesday. And so let's pray that that will go well. And Alan asked me to mention that, uh, to pray that she would not get the cold that he's got so that she could have the procedure as uh, planned. And so if you'll make that a matter of prayer, I know they would appreciate that. Appreciate Alan and Marsha, 
and the brand new members of our church. So continue to pray for them, if you will, with those needs as well. Then if you have a need tonight, uh, or, or uh, just you just want the Lord to help you tonight, would you raise your hand? So let's ask God for his blessings and his help. You pray as I pray. Let's pray together as a church family tonight. Father, we love you. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for being so good to me. Thank you, Father, for a great spirit this morning, a great crowd. Thank you for first-time visitors throughout the auditorium and returning visitors. And, uh, Father, just the, the work ethic, the ministry that took place, the kids' choir, just so many things. Father, I left today and went home and ate lunch and so encouraged to be a part of Temple Baptist Church. And, Father, back tonight, we're grateful to be here and grateful for what you've done and what you're doing in this place. Continue to work in our hearts tonight through the preaching and the singing. I pray that you would be exalted and magnified. And, Father, I pray that you would help our church family tonight. Uh, Father, you saw their hands that were lifted. You know the needs behind those. And I pray that you'd meet those needs according to your will, that you would strengthen, that you would help. Um, whatever that need may be. I pray that you'd help these that we've mentioned uh, just a moment ago, Father Barbara Falls and Charles Petit and Father Marcia, uh, going through uh, some, some uh, difficulty times. And I pray that you would bless them, help them. I pray that you'd help uh, Miss Marcia's procedure going into Tuesday, that that would go very smoothly and successfully for her. And Father, we'll thank you for what you do in our service tonight. And we'll uh, praise you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, choir's going to sing for us once again. I know you'll be blessed as they sing, worship together with your hearts unto the Lord.
standing, and I trust that that's your desire. I have decided uh, to follow Jesus, and I don't care who uh, goes with me or not. I'm going to do that. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, Joshua said. And uh, you have to make that stand today. Everybody's not serving the Lord. Everybody's not going the same direction. You've got to take a stand. And I think that uh, there's, a, there's a pressure, of course, to give in to many different uh, cultural directions. And, uh, and, and I think there's, there's a time that we're living in where Christians have to make that choice. Am I going to flow with the current of the culture, or am I going to take a biblical stand? And just because you take a stand doesn't mean you are, um, uh, that you're going, that you are, um, uh, what am I trying to say here? <laughs> I've lost my train of thought. Just because you're not, uh, just because you're taking a stand doesn't mean uh, that you're, that you're, uh, I've lost my train of thought here. I can't think here. I'm going to get my wife to come up here and preach. <laughs> Pastor of the church. Yeah, I'm joking, of course. But, uh, but I want to encourage you, again, to take that biblical stand against culture. Stand for the Lord. You won't regret it in your life. But anyway, let's pray over the offering ushers. You come at this time, if you will. I'll tell you, I've had some. I, I, this should not be happening to me at 37 years old. I'm having some memory problems. We had a family supposed to join the church this morning. And uh, I dismissed without having them join, and I said, I am so sorry. So hopefully they're going to join tonight. And um, I tell you what, I, you pray for your pastor, and you say, Pastor, you think you need some get some tests? No, I think I'm okay, but I don't know. I might consider that sometimes. But anyway, I think we're fine. But, uh, but let's pray over the offering. If you didn't get your tithe and offering in this morning, be sure to get that in tonight. And, of course, as just a real quick reminder, this is Building Fund Sunday. And uh, let's be faithful to the Building Fund if you didn't get that in and allot that for that, okay? Let's pray over the offering and ask God for his blessings tonight. Father, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to give a small portion of our what you've already blessed us with back to you. And I pray that you bless each gift and giver tonight. And we'll thank you for what you do in the remaining part of the service. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Appreciate our new edition, uh, new ad a new instrument edition, and Miss Bridget Honey started playing the violin, and I trust that you could hear that. I've been watching the live stream. I watch about every live stream after the service to make sure everything is is right on, and, and there's need to if there's any adjustments that we need to make and so forth, and uh, everything seems to go so smoothly. And I was hearing the violin on Wednesday, and it was such a blessing. And I appreciate uh, Miss Bridget being used of the Lord to do that in a great way. And appreciate all of our instrumentalists as always. We have several announcements. Let's do our birthdays and anniversaries first tonight. And uh, we have so many today. Birthdays and anniversaries. I'm looking at five tonight. So happy birthday, Heather Mosteller. Today is your birthday. Some new members of our church. We're so happy for you if you're watching online or seeing this later on. Happy birthday to you. And then Raleigh Mulgrew. Happy birthday, but how old are you, Raleigh? Sixteen. Happy birthday, buddy. We're so happy for you. And then Josephine, uh, and uh, Josephine, your birthday is May 7th. They were here this morning, and you pray for her. She's expecting the twins now, and uh, I think uh, it, are, it's you. She due in June or July, I think, in June. Okay, so we have Lakin June, uh, due in June, and then, um, and then uh, Josephine due in June. Is somebody else, some other lady due in June that I'm missing? 
we have so many ladies that are expecting. I'm excited. I can't keep track of when uh, the baby's coming and so forth. But happy birthday to you, Josephine. And then Matt and Scarlett Bennett, happy anniversary to you guys. And uh, I know they are going, they headed out of town uh, this uh, today and uh, for their anniversary that we're here this morning. So happy anniversary to you guys. And then uh, also happy birthday to Janet DeLauder uh, today as well. So all of these happening today. And then for uh, this week coming, Jad and Carolyn, your anniversary is on the 10th. So happy anniversary to you guys. Y'all are sitting really far apart tonight for your anniversary this week, and uh, I'm joking with you. Uh, May 10th, happy anniversary to you guys, and Alan Dowles, happy birthday to you. If you're watching tonight, May 11th this week, and then Pierce, happy birthday to you. How old are you going to be? 13. Wow. 14. Oh, I'm sorry. Happy birthday, Pierce, and uh, God bless you, buddy. And then Jacob Stanberry, the 13th as well. God bless you. How old are you going to be, Jacob? 20. Ha! <laughs> That's not right. I don't believe that. We're going to quit asking all these. I, I like to know, but I'm going to quit. I, I get 45? Okay, tell me really. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, I believe that. And uh, so, but anyway, happy birthday and anniversary to all of these. Let's give them a hand tonight. All right, then a couple of announcements really quickly tonight. I want to mention to you uh, Wednesday evening service. Don't forget about our Wednesday evening service this Wednesday, 7 o'clock. We're looking forward to that, as well as our Kids for Truth program, 7 o'clock over in the educational building, as well as our teen program, 7 o'clock as well. We'll be meeting in here, so keep that in mind. And then, of course, going over, meeting, assembling in here, 7, and then going over to teen program uh, during the fellowship time of handshaking. And so keep that in mind, if you will. Then also, outreach will be happening Wednesday and uh, my wife and I were so encouraged we got to vi- mis- visit a family uh, that we'd never met before and we've already we had already been through the area and knocking on doors and putting out door hangers uh, probably four or five years ago and we went back through there there was a new family that had just moved in and uh, recently in the last couple of years and uh, looking for a church and we had a very encouraging visit so let's pray that God would bless uh, visits like that that we have all the time that God will bl- give fruit a lot of times somebody doesn't come just right after you invite them sometimes it takes some time sometimes maybe even two or three months but then God uses that visit and gives fruit from that so let's pray for God's blessings on that we need to find out how many is coming for the meal I don't know what we're having it's always good Miss Kelly Honey does a wonderful job with our meal preparation and so if you plan to come for the meal at five uh, I want to encourage you to raise your hand tonight please and Brother Holly's going to count for us we always have a great time I would encourage you to get this. Excuse me. Okay, Brother Holly just mentioned something to me. Amber Gross's birthday is Friday. It's not in here. Did I miss that? It's not in the bulletin. Happy birthday, Miss Amber. We're not going to ask you how old you are. 35. Okay. We don't have. Okay, this is great. We don't have to. We don't have to ask. Okay. So happy birthday. Thank you. God bless you for your honesty. All right. Let's give Miss Amber a hand tonight. Well, the Holly, thank you for keeping me in line, all right, and giving me that I- information, all right? We would not want somebody's birthday to go unnoticed, okay? And so happy birthday to you. And then also, real quick tonight, a couple things coming up. We have a lot of things uh, uh, coming up. I want to encourage you to stay uh, in the bulletin. Uh, keep this and keep it in your Bible so you know what's coming up. Pray for the events coming up. Be a part of the events coming up. Uh, we have uh, this week, we have the ladies' uh, spring meeting uh, with Miss Jennifer White this Thursday. It'll be taking place at 7 o'clock in Heritage Hall. And I want to encourage you ladies to be a part of that. Tonight, of course, would need, need to be the deadline to sign up so they can prepare for that. There's a little over 50, I think, signed up already. I'm very encouraged by your participation in that. And I want to encourage you to uh, sign up again tonight if you haven't already done so and be a part of this great meeting and pray that the meeting will be a blessing and that God would use that in a great way, okay? And then also, uh, a couple things coming up here. Um, uh, Young Adult Fellowship coming up uh, June 3rd. This is a Saturday at 6 o'clock. I know the slideshow said 5 o'clock. We're changing that to 6 o'clock. And the reason why is because uh, we're going to be in the shade at my house, okay? I was watching yesterday, the day before, and at 6 o'clock we're in complete shade in my backyard. So, I want to be in the shade, okay? Especially if it's going to be 85 degrees, okay? And so we're going to have a great time. We're going to have barbecue and uh, play big ball volleyball for those that would like to. It's just a time of fun. And this is not just for 
uh, the, the young adults. Uh, if you have a family, most of the, our young adults do have some children, teens, whatnot. And so if you're between 19 and 49, uh, this is for your family as well. We have play set and so forth, all kinds of stuff for the kids. And they'll have a great time. And so we're looking forward to that. Okay, there's no sign-up sheet, uh, but uh, just plan on coming for that. Uh, if you would, we're looking forward to that. And then also, the VBS volunteer sign-up uh, is over there by the desk, by the media, on the table by the media desk. And I want to encourage you to sign up. Miss Holly's the deadline tonight. Okay, so the deadline for that is tonight. And we need a lot of help for this, as usual. As usual, we have a lot of people to sign up already. We need your help. We need people to teach classes. We need people to assist in that teaching department. And I would encourage you to be a part of that, if you will, please, for this coming uh, summer. It'll be uh, the day, start the day after Father's Day. But we need to go ahead and get that curriculum to you in your hands in the next coming weeks. And go ahead and make preparations for that. It'll be next month. Can you believe that? And so let's uh, be in prayer for that, and again, help us with that, if you will, okay? Then also, Widowed Ladies Luncheon. This is a monthly activity. Appreciate Ms. Beverly Smith heading this up, doing the good job with this. Tuesday at 1130, you'll be meeting uh, at the Southern Family Restaurant here in Pofftown. There's a sign-up sheet in the entryway. I want to encourage you to be a part of that, and uh, if you're a widowed lady, okay? Then Mother's Day is next Sunday. Uh, a couple things about Mother's Day. Uh, you don't go to your mother's church, your mother comes to your church, okay? And uh, I'm joking, of course, but uh, on a serious note, I want to encourage you to invite your mom uh, to be with you, and, uh, and let's, let's enjoy this special Mother's Day. I think we're going to have some video production and so forth to, to, to share with you, and it's going to be a very special day. We have a gift for each mom, and, uh, and so be here, be faithful to that. Uh, Sunday school, at normal 10 o'clock, and then the normal 11 o'clock service. Uh, there's two Sundays out of the year that we do not have service. That's Mother's Day and Father's Day. All the rest of the year, we have the Sunday evening service. So no Sunday night next week, okay? Uh, take the time to spend time with your family. Enjoy the time uh, that you have together, okay? So keep all of that in mind, if you will. We have a special tonight, and as they get ready, I want to encourage you to take your Bibles, please, to the book of Mark, chapter number 9. Mark, chapter number 9, in your Bibles this evening. And I want you to sh I want to share some just simple uh, truths with you that the Lord had spoken to my heart about and that I believe will be a blessing to you tonight. Mark chapter number 9, we're continuing our series from the uh, Gospel of Mark. I trust that the messages have been a blessing and a help and encouragement to you. Tonight's message will be a little bit different. It's more like a Sunday school class. Uh, you'll see that in just a few moments. I was uh, going down through here, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, some passages of Scripture, raise your hand if you understand, are a little bit more hard to understand than others, okay? Uh, when the Bible says, love one another, be kind one to another, I can understand that pretty easy. But some passages you really have to study. You really have to dig. I have several commentator, commentaries that I read after. And uh, this is some of this passages that we're going to look at tonight is when some of the commentators don't have a lot to say because they don't know exactly. We're going to cover that as best we can, but I don't want to pass over it just because we don't understand it. We're going to give you some thoughts that we uh, believe that it, that it means. And, uh, but I, I think sometimes we need to have teaching. Amen? Uh, I think that's very important to not only preach and make practical application and, and, and uh, you know, lift up your voice like a trumpet, as God told one of the Old Testament prophets, and uh, make practical application, but also we need some teaching as well. And uh, I believe there should be some preach in it, uh, but there, we also need some understanding of what the Bible says as well. So we're going to try to do that tonight with the Lord's help, and I trust it will be a blessing to you. I know this song will be a blessing. You listen, and then we'll be back in Mark 9. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast burned 
thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. All I have needed hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Well done. Thank you so much. Raise your hand if you're grateful for God is faithful. And I appreciate that good song tonight. Mark chapter 9 in your Bible. And again, thank you for being here, being faithful on this summer feeling Sunday night. And I'm excited about our summer sizzling Sunday nights coming up this summer. And uh, this is uh, something we've done the last couple of years after our Sunday night services, having barbecue, hot dogs, and different things. And uh, that's always a highlight. Looking forward to that. It's getting feeling like summertime. And uh, so I'm enjoying this part of the year. Summertime is very special to me. Yeah, it's a time in my life when I was 19 when I surrendered my life to the Lord. And at a youth conference in Pigeon Forge. And I'm excited for some of you guys to be able to go to Youth Congress in, uh, in uh, Powell, Tennessee, outside of Knoxville. Here the week of July 4th, as we normally do. Appreciate Brother Miss Holly taking them. And uh, I'm looking forward to going on that next year with Joanna. She'll be, uh, if she chooses to, to go, we'll be going there and uh, looking forward to that as well. And I know that's a great meeting. And I encourage you young people to be a part of that if all possible. Mark chapter 9, verse number 33. In verse number 33, let's begin reading uh, the text this evening. The Bible says, And he, that is Jesus, came to Capernaum, and being in the house... He asked them, the, them is his disciples, what was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? In other words, they were arguing amongst themselves. In verse 34, but they held their peace. For by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same should be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, 
Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. And of course, that's the Father. Verse number 38. And John answering him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us, and we forbade him. In other words, they forbid him. They told him not to do that, to come follow us. Because he followeth not us. In verse 39, but Jesus said, forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against is on our part. Against us is on our part. Verse 41, for whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. Verse 42 is from very solemn scripture reading. But nonetheless, and by the way, we should not water down what Jesus is teaching. Uh, we should not use it in a harsh manner, but the truth is the truth. Nonetheless, verse 42, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. That's powerful. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Now, Jesus is not saying do this, literally, but understand what he's, the teaching he's getting across here. We'll come to this in a few moments. Uh, and if thy foot offend thee, excuse me, verse, let's uh, look back with me uh, in verse number 44. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Verse 47, If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. For every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his saltness, Wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. Let's pray together. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for your word. And I thank you for speaking to my heart about this some days ago. And I pray that you give me clarity of thought in mind tonight. And I pray that you would help me. I need you. I can do nothing. We can do nothing apart from you. And I pray that you'd use me for just a few moments to be just, just totally saturated in these truths tonight. And uh, use me to be a blessing just for a few moments to our church family in trying to explain and applying some of these truths tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been in this series, of course, the Gospel of Mark. There's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all four give an account of what uh, happened uh, in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Now tonight, as you can see, we're going to be talking about choosing the spiritual over the natural. And that is, the, I believe, the, the, the sum uh, of what is going on in this conversation. This is, if you read back through, you'll, you'll know that it is a conversation that is taking place between Jesus and his disciples beginning in verse number 33 and going to verse number 50. So it's one conversation. There's different topics being discussed here. Uh, in verse number 33, we pick up where Jesus and his disciples were walking down a road toward the town of Capernaum. And I could see Jesus being maybe 10, 15, 20 foot up and leading his disciples towards Capernaum and the disciples being back in the back. Jesus hears them disputing, arguing amongst themselves. Does anybody argue? Don't raise your hand. Does anybody argue? Okay, do you dispute? And uh, you say, yes, but pastor, it's very spiritual disputing, okay? These disciples were not necessarily spiritually disputing. They were more carnally, naturally, humanly uh, arguing, disputing amongst themselves who should be the greatest. When they got to the house that they were going to, Jesus asked, him, asked these disciples about it. By the way, Jesus hears everything. He knows everything. And can I remind you that they did, they never, evidently, they never told Jesus what they were arguing about because they were ashamed of that. But Jesus knew. He heard. 
and he saw what they were disputing about. And so he asked them when they get to the house, what were you disputing amongst yourselves back when we were traveling down to this house? And they didn't say anything. And they knew, Jesus knew. And then he begins teaching them some truths. He confronted them about their disputing. And then again, this conversation takes place. And I want us to know just simple four truths that I believe will help us uh, tonight uh, in, in this topic of choosing the spiritual over the natural. And I believe that uh, th- it'll make sense when we get done why the title is such tonight. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to notice the first thing tonight, these four truths that we're going to take out of this conversation that Jesus is happy, having with his disciples. The first truth is the truth of position. The truth of position. Back in verse number 33 down to verse number 37, again, we find that the disciples uh, were seeking the top position as chief disciple, if you will. They want to know amongst the twelve who was the top. Who was the top pick? Who was the chief? Who was in charge of the twelve? Now, they knew that Jesus... Uh, was uh, in charge. They knew that. They had enough sense of that. But amongst themselves, who was the best? Who was the wisest? Who was the smartest? Who was the most talented? Who was competent above all the other ones? Who uh, ha- was smarter than the others? Who had uh, more intellect than others? Who had more common sense than the others? And I can, I can hear them. Can you not? I mean, sometimes when you read your Bible, some of you Bible students can understand the disciples, just like everybody in this room has a different personality, these disciples had different personalities. You think about Peter, James, and John. They were what? What were their occupation before they become a disciple of Christ? They were fishermen. They were simple fishermen. What was Matthew? He was a tax collector. I guarantee they had some interesting conversations. Nobody liked the tax collectors in Jesus' day. You know why? Because they cheated people. They said, they looked at their paperwork and they said, yeah, government says you owe $10. That'll be 15 bucks. And you would pay them 15 bucks. And guess what? They would put $5 in their pocket. And they cheated people. That's why nobody liked Zacchaeus. And, uh, and, uh, and so uh, Matthew was uh, now saved. He was a disciple of Christ. He was a follower of Christ. But all these disciples had different, uh, different jobs. You know, we know that Judas, we believe that Judas kept the money amongst the disciples. And perhaps Judas Iscariot, as he's walking down, he said, guys, I think I ought to be the, the, the most important guy, the disciple uh, the one people come to and so forth because, uh, let's just be honest, I, I'm, I'm very important because I'm carrying the money. I could hear Peter say, Judas, you don't know anything. You may know how to do the figures, but you don't have a lick of common sense. Sounds like something that Peter may say. Peter was the spokesperson for the group, wasn't he? He seemed to be the one that was very uncareful about what he said. He didn't really care. He said some really good things, but he said some things he was kind of ashamed of, didn't he? And so Peter probably assumed that he was the top pick of the disciples, the twelve, because he had the mouth. He had the tongue, a wise tongue in his perspective, perhaps. We looked at not too long ago on a Sunday night. He said something about building three tabernacles at the uh, transfiguration of Jesus because he just said it because he didn't know what else to say. And maybe Peter said, oh, you don't know nothing, Judas. And maybe Matthew spoke up and said, listen, I ought to be the real uh, treasurer in this department because I was the tax collector. I know how to do this. Judas, give me that bag. And they were just, I could picture them in John saying, listen, fellas, I'm Jesus' favorite. You know that. I am the chief disciple. And Jesus is listening. He doesn't say one thing to them as they're walking to this house in Capernaum. But when, G, when they get there in private, and by the way, uh, that's always the best time to confront somebody on a personal basis is, and, and be careful with embarrassing people. And I think Jesus was obviously God and had infinite wisdom about going about this. And Jesus set them down. And look at verse number 34, what Jesus taught them about this truth of seeking a position in leadership. Verse number 34, but they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed amongst themselves who should be greatest. Notice again in verse number 35. And he sat down 
and called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the greatest, the best, the most important, the same shall be last of all and servant all. You see, the natural human instinct, even amongst us today, even among people today, the natural, and even in Christians, listen, the disciples were followers of Jesus Christ. They walked with Christ. They heard him speak on on the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever, and they saw him do these miracles. They walked and ate with Jesus Christ, and yet now they're disputing amongst themselves. Don't tell me that people in Baptist churches don't do that. And they're disputing amongst themselves. And sometimes the human and the natural instinct is to climb to the top position. Well, I'm, you know, if I quit the choir, you know, they're going to struggle. You know, it's a good thing I did the special tonight. That service is really going downhill. (laughs) You know, sometimes we think a lot of ourselves, you know, it's a good thing I'm teaching that class because I don't know who else would do it. Can I just be honest with you? Everybody in this room is, is replaceable. From the pastor all the way to... And I'm not saying that I'm the top pick either. I'm just simply saying from the office of the pastor, the deacons, every aspect of the church, everybody can be replaced. Don't ever think that I'm Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so and nobody could take my place. You'll be surprised how, who God could use. And so may God help us to keep a humble spirit. The Bible teaches us in Luke chapter 14, verse number 11, for whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. In other words, abased means to be brought low. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. God uses over and over and over in the New Testament, we find that God uses not the pride. Matter of fact, God hates pride and the proud and the proud heart, but God uses those who humble themselves and say, I just want to be a servant. I just want to do and be used where I can. And, and I don't want to draw attention to myself. I just want to magnify Jesus Christ and, and do what I can do and, uh, instead of looking for a position. And again, the natural human instinct is to climb to the top position, to, to say, well, I, you know, I, I think I'm probably the most important. I'm probably the most intellect. I probably need to do this position in the church, and I probably need to do this, and I need to do this, just like the disciples. And again, Jesus teaches us in verse number 35, the same, those that are first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. One reason we can look at that is because pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. When you think you're the first, when you think you're the greatest, when you think you're the best, watch out. You're getting ready to be servant of all. God has a way to bring those who are very prideful and arrogant and cocky and thinking that they're the smartest and they're the best and they're the most well-equipped. He has a good way of bringing us very low, doesn't he? And may the Lord help us. Uh, Notice what happens after this. In verse number 36 and 37, things change a little bit. Jesus kind of, in this conversation, changes gears a little bit. Although it's the same conversation, it's almost on the same topic, but he brings a little child to himself. Raise your hand if you've ever saw the little Bible, the diagram, or the picture, the illustration with Jesus and the children all around him. Look here in verse number 36. Jesus, and he took a child and set him in the midst of them, and when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. Jesus, again, on this topic of, of this, these disciples disputing amongst themselves, who would be the greatest, who would be the smartest, who is the chief or the top pick of the disciples and those the twelve, and who is the greatest among them? Jesus said, listen, guys. The, the one who's the first and foremost, the one who thinks they're the smartest, they're truly going to be servant of all. And we need to humble ourselves. And he brings a little child to him and says, and talks about the, 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 the child and receiving a child. Now, understand that in this perspective, in this mindset, this is bringing a humility and a spirit of humility in these disciples' minds. They are thinking in their minds, 
we are going to sit in this kingdom. Understand, they didn't see the cross clearly at this point. They were still thinking that Jesus is going to set up his millennial reign. They're thinking that, yes, I'm going to sit on the right side of the throne. I'm going to be judging the 12 tribes. I'm going to have this position in the millennial kingdom. They were looking at Old Testament prophecy regarding the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ. They were looking at that. And now for Jesus to say, to take a child, and say, whosoever receiveth him, it would be very humbling to the disciples from going to a mindset of I'm the greatest to making sure that we're caring about a little runny-nosed, peanut butter and jelly all over the mouth, little child. You know, we need to make sure that we are staying busy reaching and receiving others. It will keep our mind off ourselves. Sometimes when we are not busy trying to reach others with the gospel, when we are not busy praying for others and trying to be an encouragement to others, sometimes we can get our minds upon ourselves and we can begin becoming prideful about ourselves. And I just want to encourage you with this simple truth of, of position. And we don't have this issue here, to my knowledge, uh, in any way, shape, or form. It's just in the series, and I, it's good to learn this. Uh, don't ever have this seeking a position of leadership within a local church. Now, obviously, there's positions of leadership. You have to have leadership in a church. There's, it's set forth in Scripture, pastor and deacon, and, of course, there's many others. But never seek that position. Uh, but all, always look for a way that we can serve others. In so doing, we can be greatly used of the Lord. So the truth of position. Then, notice the second truth tonight, quickly. The truth of prohibiting. The truth of prohibiting. So we have the truth of position. Jesus says, don't, be, don't fight amongst yourselves who's the greatest. Uh, you need to uh, have a, a mindset of humility and, and reaching other people, of, of even children and having the mindset of a little child and, and, uh, and, and having this mindset. Uh, and then the truth of prohibiting. Now there's two areas of prohibiting that I want us to notice tonight. One, there's the truth of prohibiting others. And then there's the truth of prohibiting offenses. Now, look with me in verse number 38 through verse number 41. We find that the conversation continues. If you still have your Bible open, understand that uh, where Jesus, at the end of verse number 37, Jesus says, but him that sent me, verse 38, the conversation continues. The, apostle, the, the disciple John uh, answers back. And so it's a conversation, ongoing conversation. And John brings up this situation where he and the other disciples saw someone casting out devils in Jesus' name. So they go to him, they confront him and say, Hey, look, we're doing the same thing. We're followers of Jesus. Follow us as we follow Christ. You can be number 13. And he wouldn't do it. And so something in this conversation has brought up in uh, John's mind that, wait a minute, something's not right here, Jesus, because he's casting out devils in your name, but he wouldn't follow us. So what? What's with that? Lord, I don't understand that situation. Would you explain it to me? And Jesus does. In verse number 39 and verse number 40, but Jesus said, forbid him not. For there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. Verse 40, for he that is not against us is on our part. Now, sometimes you say, Pastor, how in the world does this apply for, for, to me today? I'm glad you asked. Sometimes we run across people that are trying to do something for the Lord and yet are not in our camp. Now, when I say camp, it means that... Um, they may be trying to reach others and they may be preaching out of the word of God and they may be trying to live for the Lord in, in, in certain areas and they have the right doctrine in mind. But we would not necessarily feel comfortable perhaps in that ministry style. You understand that there's no two churches alike. There's no, it, there's no two churches alike, period. There's churches that are similar in their ministry style as uh, far as the choir would sing the same songs. Uh, there, is, there is standards of representing Christ, like being Christ-like and having a sweet spirit. Uh, there's, there's churches that are going to have the same ministry mindset, but no two churches are really the same. 
pastors. There's no two pastors the same, period. I've got pastor friends, and guess what? They would pastor their church a little bit different because they think a little bit different than I would. So there's no two churches alike. There's no two ministries alike. And a church down the road that us preaching the gospel could perhaps reach somebody that I couldn't and perhaps God could use us to reach somebody that they couldn't. And so I'm thankful for other ministries. And so what Jesus, I believe, is saying is here is basically don't criticize and don't throw rocks at somebody that's trying to live for the Lord just because they're not in your camp. Now I want to bring about a, a unique little thought on this that I want you to, uh, to, 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 to consider. And that is, we should be like the disciples in that we want to be as close to Jesus as possible. Do we not? Now, I'm kind of like the disciples. I'm kind of like Peter, James, and John, and Matthew, and all the others. Kind of like Thomas and all the others. I mean, if I see somebody doing something in Jesus' name, I'm like, if I, if I were them, and I saw somebody casting out spirits in, in Jesus' name and trying to do work for the Lord, I would go to him and I'd say, hey, us 12, we meet together and Jesus teaches us. And Man, you can't believe the miracles that he does. And listen, man, he's, this is the Messiah. This, you, you understand, this is, that's Jesus Christ. We're followers of him. Why don't you join us? Uh-uh. So if I was a disciple, I would think the same thing as John. What? Don't you want to be with Jesus? No. Kind of a little interesting, isn't it? Because the disciples said... Come be with us, and he wouldn't. So they said, look, what's your problem? You don't want to be just like us? But Jesus basically says, leave it alone. I'm kind of like that too. I have a ministry mindset, and I think everybody should have my ministry mindset. <laughs> I think everybody should have church just like Temple Baptist Church. I just think that, you know, we have the best church in the world. I'm just, you know, my pastor used to say, a frog that won't croak in his own pond ain't much of a frog. And uh, I just believe that uh, we have the best church in the world. I just believe that. I'm excited about what God has done. I'm excited about what God is doing. I'm so excited for the future now more than ever before. But that means just because somebody doesn't do it just like we do it, that doesn't mean that we are to criticize. Don't ever criticize another church. Now, again, I want to be as close to Christ as possible. I want to be just like these disciples. I Sometimes I scratch my head and I want to say, if, you, if you're a follower of Jesus, why are you doing that? But you just leave that to the Lord. That God, they will answer the Lord. And listen, now if they're not doctrinally straight, there is issues. We're not talking about doctrine. We're talking about practice. We're talking about ministry style and so forth. Uh, but when it comes to doctrine, listen, we ought to be, uh, make sure we're on the same page. Amen? Now, let's look at the next one, the next prohibiting here. So the, the truth of prohibiting. Uh, I told you it was going to be kind of like a class tonight. I hope you're okay with that. Uh, but this is just what the Lord has played in my heart for tonight. But the, the, the truth of prohibiting others. Jesus said, listen, don't just leave him alone. Just leave him alone. Uh, the truth of prohibiting offenses. Now, in verse number 42 through verse number 48, we read some very solemn warnings of hell. Let's just be honest. We read from very straightforward what Jesus said about hell. Hell. Three times he mentioned there, if we're not mistaken, the wor where the worm, their worm, dieth not and the fire is not quenched. He's talking about hell and Jesus preached more about hell than he did in heaven if you study the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And can I say that the first thing that Jesus mentioned that we're not to offend and that is others. In verse number 42, Whosoever shall offend, and basically what he's talking about there is constantly causing others to stumble. If you're constantly causing others to stumble, that are Christians, that are believers, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. So Jesus said, listen, uh, we should never attempt to offend others. Now, are you going to offend other people? It's going to happen. One of my favorite verses I like that, my wife said she grew up with in her home was her dad, my father-in-law, would say, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. We live in a society that are looking for somebody to offend them so they can start an argument, so they can get on Facebook and say, la, 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 la. That's what it sounds like to me. It's like static. We look for, people are constantly looking for, for stuff to cause arguments and so forth. And you offended me. You looked at me like that. I know, I, I know what you're thinking. 
Offend, constantly people being offended. Great peace. Psalms. Great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing shall offend them. Listen, don't let everything and everybody offend you. <laughs> Sometimes pastors have to have elephant skin. Uh, sometimes, because, listen, sometimes everybody doesn't say, God bless you, Pastor, that was the best message I've ever heard. Everybody doesn't say that. You know, we have the sweetest, best church in the world, and I'm so grateful for that. And sometimes people are going to say things to you, and they're never going to mean to say them the way they did. And you've got to just let that, you got to, we taught in our committed class this morning, in Acts chapter 28, where Paul got bit by that viper. You know what he did when he got bit by the viper? He didn't say, why me? He didn't look at that snake and said, you dumb animal. He didn't look at the barbarous people and say, it's all your fault. He didn't look at God and say, why'd you send this storm and shipwreck us on this crazy knucklehead island? He didn't, it wasn't, you know, he didn't go off on everybody. He shook him off. And sometimes when we have situations in our life, you know what you do? You shake it off. You go on. You keep your eyes on the Lord. Amen? Uh, but uh, we find that uh, sometimes, uh, again, we're not to, on that flip side, don't, don't, let people, don't let everybody offend you. But be careful, don't offend others. Now, we should not worry, live in a status of fear about that. But just don't, don't look for ways and allow your life to be a stumbling block in other people's lives. Jesus said, also, we should not offend ourselves. Now, verse number 43, verse 48, look at it again. Notice that Jesus, in verse number 43, he talks about the hand. He says, if your hand offends you, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And then in verse number 45, he talks about the foot. In verse number 47, he talks about your eyes, your eye. You know what Jesus is basically saying? He said, if your hand, what, 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 remember what offensive we're talking about here, what it means? It means to cause, to stumble. And then listen, he said, if your eyes are going to cause you to stumble if your eyes are going to keep you in trouble and keep you from being saved, then it's better for you to pluck them out than you, for you to spend eternity in a place called hell. You can say, Pastor, I just don't believe in a literal hell. Then you're saying that Jesus was wrong when he mentioned this. And my Savior is not wrong. There is a literal hell. The Bible says in Luke chapter 16 that the rich man lifted up his eyes because he was tormented in this flame. The Bible says, the last book of the Bible in Revelation gives us one last warning. It says, in death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. There's a real place called real, I don't care what the theologians say, I don't care what scholars say, I don't care what the most quote-unquote brilliant people say in Christianity today. Jesus said, God's word says, there is a literal hell with real fire. And I'm just going to take Jesus at his word. Sometimes you have to evaluate and you say, well, I've been following so-and-so for years and years. And now they say there's a no hell. Well, you're going to have to discern whether you're going to follow a man or you're going to follow God's word. A man's going to say there was incorrections. There's, uh, excuse me, there's, there's uh, places in the Bible and scripture and text are incorrect. And you're going to have to discern in your home, in your mind, in your heart, whether God's right or man's right. And God tells us, let God be true and every man a liar. And I decided a long time ago, I'm just going to go with God. I'm just going to take the simple truths of the Word of God and simply believe them. I, if you jump on the trend wagon, if you jump on the trend train, you're going to live a life like a yo-yo. You're going to live a life of, of being tossed to and fro. Everything new thing that comes along you're going to be wa washed ashore and all kinds of different things and, and just blown away by things. And uh, listen, let's stick to the principles and the foundation of the Word of God. And Jesus says here, basically, listen, if your hand is going to cause you to keep you from being saved, if your feet are going to cause you to go places and it's going to keep you from trusting in Jesus Christ, it would be better for you to cut off your feet to be saved 
in, instead of spending eternity in fire. What does that mean? It says, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. That basically means it's referring, the worm is no doubt referring to a person's soul, their being. And it's basically saying that a person goes to hell and they never die. They spend there forever and ever for all eternity. Oh, just like heaven's for all eternity, hell is for all eternity. Let me say this, if you're not saved tonight, don't leave here without trusting Christ as your personal Savior. Now, notice the third truth real quick tonight, and I'm almost done. So we find the truth of position. Jesus said, don't seek to be in a prominent position because you will become a servant of all. You let the Lord exalt you. You seek to be humble before God and seek to please Him and God will use you. You be like, humble yourself like a little child and re learn to reach others. And then we find the truth of prohibiting. Jesus said, don't prohibit others. Don't keep others from living for God. You, you just keep your eyes upon the Lord and do what you know to do. And then the prohibiting of offenses. Number three, quickly tonight, the truth of productivity. Now, some of you won't believe this, but I'm almost done. I'm looking at the conclusion right here in my notes. The truth of productivity. Look in verse number 49. These are some of the most... Um, uh, interesting text, interesting scripture references, interesting verses. And this is where a lot of commentators get really uh, 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 kind of quiet on what they believe. There's so many different perspectives on this. But I want to give you some, I don't want us to get so overwhelmed with things that we cannot necessarily completely explain. I want us to grasp a hold of a truth of what we believe it is and run with that. But don't get overwhelmed with it. Look in verse 49. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. Now, again, we're talking about the truth of productivity. And here, I believe that Jesus is, uh, is again, he just got off the subject of fire, hell, no doubt referring to uh, judgment in that, uh, with that mindset. We mentioned the lake of fire. And now Jesus changes gears evidently a little bit and, and, and goes into a more of a judgment position, a judgment mindset, the judgment to come. Uh, John Phillips, I, I, I was reading his commentary, and I believe that he had a good thought on this. This verse number 49, for everyone shall be salted with fire and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Uh, I believe that it is referring to us being productive for our lives for we will one day be judged. John Phillips gives reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 on this and how that the Bible says in verse number 12 through 15. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by what? Fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, so yet, so yet so as by fire. So again, total different message, but a relationship there with referring to verse number 49 and understanding that it's probably referring to judgment. Again, this one conversation, it's, it's, it's going different directions, uh, but we find that Jesus just talked about fire, just talked about hell, uh, no doubt having the mindset of judgment to come. And changing gears a little bit as he's talking to his disciples and referring to perhaps judgment to come when he said, For every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Again, referring to the fact that our sacrifices and our uh, life of for living for Christ will one day be judged by fire. It also perhaps gives a reference back to the Old Testament when sacrifices were salted. So let me just bring a simple applicable truth from that. I know it's a little bit deep and a little bit a lot to think about there. But let me give you a little bit of, of application to go home with. Verse number 50 clears up just a little bit. And it's something that we could all take home with us tonight. We should all be productive, no doubt because of the judgment there in verse 49 to come. The judgment seat of Christ. But in verse number 50, the Bible says, salt is good. Does anybody want to say amen there? Listen, 
I'm scared of salt. Salt and butter. I don't know what it is, but it's like my kids, they want to they wanna get out the butter. My wife is just egging them on with this, and she gets out the butter and just like, lap, you know, just loads it on everything. And I, and yeah, and it's like, I'm scared. I'm listening. I'm thinking, heart attack right there. No, you can only, and my kids don't know, you know, they're just, you know, glob of butter. We, I, we, I was teenagers growing up. Preston, I don't know if you were with us. Were you with us when that guy ate that whole cube of butter? Were we together? No, it was a different time. We were, we, I was growing up, was, we, we bet this guy, I was five bucks. I was a teenager, and uh, we bet this guy five bucks. You know the butter, the sticks of butter? You know what I'm talking about? I can't remember how big it is, about that big, you know, like a stick of butter. And we bet this guy, they were on the tables at a dining area, and this guy, he had to be a nut just like us, because he did it. And uh, we said, hey, listen, we, uh, you know, I'll pay you five bucks if you eat that whole stick of butter in one setting. He did it. And I'm thinking to myself, we've, we're going to kill this guy. He's going to die. <laughs> five bucks. We're, he's, he wasn't worth it. And uh, I'm scared of butter. I'm scared of salt. Uh, listen, I like salt in my food. Just don't show me what you're doing when you cook it. Just put it in there. But when it comes to my plate, I'll hold the... I'm just a weird guy, I guess. I like pepper. I like Texas Pete, but just don't give me a lot of butter on the side. It's just, a, I guess, a, a something in my mind. I guess it's mental. You say, Pastor, yeah, you've got a lot of mental issues. I know. All right. My wife has been telling me that for years. But notice in verse number 50, salt is good. It is good. A lot of things, if you don't cook it with salt, you know, you cookers. It's no good. So put it in there. Just don't show me. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltness, wherewith shall you season it? Have salt in yourselves. Can I encourage you with something to take home tonight? Be a salty Christian. You can have a whole different message of different practical things to be. One, we can be a fruity Christian. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Be a fruity Christian and be a salty Christian. Be fruity and be salty. If you want something to take home with you, write it down. Be fruity and be salty. You know what salt does, especially in this day, in Jesus' day? Salt would do two main things. Salt would heal. It was an antiseptic, and it would also be a preservative. You put salt on stuff, it would preserve that. Salt was an antiseptic, it would heal, and also it would be a, pre a pre preservative. And that's exactly what Jesus wants us to do. Uh, Jesus wants us to bring in healing to a situation as a, as a salty Christian. He wants us to be a preservative. We talked about in 2 Thessalonians in our study on Wednesdays in our Bible study and about how that soon to come, the Antichrist will appear, but before the Antichrist comes on the scene, we're going to get out of here. And it talks about the Holy Spirit and how He is going to be removed. But you know what He is doing right now? You know what the Holy Spirit, one of the things the Holy Spirit of God does through our lives? We stand for righteousness. We stand. Did you know, you know why the Satan, the Satanists, do you know why the anti-God movement cannot have their full-blown way? Because of people like you all over this nation that we may seem... If you watch the news, it may seem that we're very few and far between, that there's people on Sunday night all over this nation right now and preachers preaching the truth of the Word of God right now that's salt in this world and keeping all hell from breaking loose. One day at the rapture, the Holy Spirit who dwells within us and believers will be gone and the Antichrist will come on the scene. All hell will break loose. I'm glad I'm not going to be here. But understand that we are to be salt of the world. And this last thing, and I'm done. Notice number four, the truth of peace. Look what Jesus says in verse number 50 as he, they wind up this conversation according to Mark. What does Jesus say in verse number 50 at the last portion? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Look back with me in verse number thirty. 34, it all started with this issue with them disputing amongst themselves. 
See Peter shoving Judas Iscariot. Get out of my... You've been aggravating me, buddy. I can see Matthew pushing John a little bit. Listen, buddy, you're getting... You're on my last... My last temper. You're, you're, you're pushing my buttons. It's been a long time since I heard that. You're pushing my buttons, buddy. Listen, maybe we just need to take a break. Because you're getting on my nerves, Thomas. You're not the best. You think you are. They're disputing amongst themselves. It all came, it all started, this whole conversation came from here. And Jesus says, be peace among yourselves. You're to be salt in this world. You're to bring forth a healing uh, spirit of, of healing. And let me ask you a question. I close with this. When we live in a world that is, there's so much turmoil and aggravations and lack of peace. That's what everybody cries for, peace, peace, peace. The only way to have peace in your heart and peace with one another is through Jesus Christ. That's it. But the world doesn't want Christ, and so the world is not going to have peace. You can do whatever you want. You can look for this avenue, and you can do this, and you can have this activity in your life. But the truth of the matter is, through Christ Jesus, we can experience peace. We can experience the peace with God, and we can experience the peace of God that passes all of understanding through the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you troubled? Are you, do you have issues? Why, why have those when you can have the peace that God can give you about eternity, about your life? Why, why have that when you can have the peace of God? Everything is not perfect in my life. Sometimes I think my life is upside down sometimes. But I'm grateful for the peace of God. It passes all of understanding. I don't understand it. But I know that when I go to the Lord, He gives me peace. There's something to live for in life. And Jesus says, be at peace among yourselves. What, great, what greater thing does our society need today than the peace that God gives? When you come into a situation, whether it's in your marriage, or whether it's a co-worker at work, or wherever it is, kids at school, do you bring peace to that situation? Jesus says, be peace among yourselves. You're to be, we're to be the salt of the earth. We're to remember that we're not to seek to be the greatest. We're to look at other children. We're to look at serving other people. We're to humble ourselves. And we're to be productive in this world. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. If you're here tonight and not saved, I know it's a little bit different of a message, more of a teaching lesson, but if you're here tonight and not saved, don't leave this place without getting saved tonight. Would you do that? Would you let somebody take their Bible one-on-one and show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Would you do that tonight? If you have a need tonight as a child of God, as a saved individual, would you come forward and maybe come to the altar and say, Lord, I sure do want to be a salty Christian. I want to bring a, a, a comfort in a society that has no peace. And I want to be a healing agent in my family. I want to bring a, 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 a spirit of peace and healing and and comfort in the society which we live. I don't want to have this mindset of being top dog. and I want to have a, a spirit of simply being a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, I know in my heart, as musicians begin playing, Pastor, I know in my heart I'm saved. I know if I died, I know I'm going to heaven. I know I've trusted Christ. Would you lift up your hand tonight? I know it's a Sunday night. Would you lift up your hand tonight? I wonder if you're here tonight with heads bowed and eyes are closed. You say, Pastor, I want to be honest with you. I know for sure I'm not saved. And if I died, I have a little concern about that. I do not know where I'm spending eternity in heaven or hell. I want you to pray for me. I will in confidence. Would you raise your hand right now and say, Pastor, would you pray for me that I would make that decision to trust Christ? Anybody like that? Sir, ma'am, boy, girl. How about this just tonight? If you have a need, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm just going to ask you to come or whatever the Lord has challenged you in your heart. As we stand together right now with heads bowed and eyes are closed, Brother Holly's going to sing as he sings. Would you come right now? How about Take you? my life Lord, help me. and Salt let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love at the impulse of thy love let's sing the second verse together take my feet and let them be sweet
swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Always only for my King. Let's pray together tonight. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. I pray that you would Help us to implement these truths to our lives. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can look this way. Musicians, you can play, continue playing. Dale and Barbara, y'all come up here. I love these this family's couple. They are such a blessing. They're here about every time the doors are open. And um, I, 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 they were supposed to join this morning. And your crazy pastor forgot. Oh, Listen, I, I'm going to forget things. I remember one pastor telling me, it, it made me feel a little bit good at the moment. He, You know what he forgot? A wedding ceremony. Yeah. So, I'll tell you who it was, Miss Carolyn, later on. But anyway, oh, so that hasn't happened yet. So, but anyway, we love this couple. If you would like to join our church by transfer a letter from Louisville Baptist Church. Do we have a motion to receive them on that basis? Motion. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. Say amen. amen. We love them. I want to encourage you to give them the right hand of fellowship. Let's come around this way, please. Visitors, thank you for being here tonight. We're so grateful that you're here. Don't forget about the sign-up sheets, uh, some deadlines with the ladies' meeting, as well as VBS. So keep that in mind, if you will, please, with those deadlines that I have to sign up. God bless you. Turn around, smile, shake one another's hands. We'll see you Wednesday night.